Okay. Hi, Matt State from Martial Arts GB Business Group. And today I've got with me Kevin O'Hagan. So um, Kevin's been around for a very, very long time and it's a real privilege to have him on board. Hi, Kevin, how are you? Hello, Matt. I'm great, thank you. And yourself? Yeah, I'm very good, thank you. Yes. Um, so thanks for coming on. And I always start with the same thing. So just in case anybody's not aware of some of what you do, could you give us a little overview of yourself? Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, I first started martial arts way back in 1975, so it's around about 45 years I've been involved now uh, training in martial arts and teaching since the early 80s. Um, I've always had an open mind in martial arts training and I've trained uh, across the board in many, many styles with many different instructors, uh, but my base art since the 80s has been uh, Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. I was recently awarded my eighth dan by Dave Turton, uh, which was a great honor and totally unexpected. So um, uh, that's really where my, my base is, although I've obviously um, done a lot of other stuff as well along the line. And been teaching in Bristol since about 1982 when I opened my first club. Right, so that's a heck of a long time. And congratulations on your eighth dan, by the way. So Thanks uh, very much. I mean, that, that's a heck of an achievement. So. Uh, both you and I have had the privilege to do uh, to do a lot of stuff with Dave Turton, and uh, again, he's one of the one of the genuine legends that are that, that can be, that, that that have earned the name of that. So, um, sure. as, so one of the things that people I talk about with people is especially over the, the the time frame because you started way 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 back a long time ago, and that was even before the sort of if you like the Bruce Lee phenomenon. So yeah. what was it that sort of, what, what brought you into martial arts in the first place? Yeah, well, really, um, I never really excelled at any particular sport. I enjoyed sport, but there was nothing that um, I really either liked or um, truly wanted to get involved in. And um, it really was just at the very start of uh, the Bruce Lee era that um, I just read a magazine about this guy and... Uh, you know, he was a he was a small guy, a slight built guy, and but he was doing this, these incredible things, and um, it just struck a chord with me. I uh, I thought I would love to be able to, you know, do something like that, and um, that really became my inspiration. I think back then, particularly in the, the movies, uh, you know, you had people like John Wayne, Clint Eastwood. They were all big guys that you know you never had a smaller guy you know, um, showing any fighting skills. I think Bruce Lee was the first one to break that mold. And um, it really encouraged me with a bit of self-belief to, uh, to believe that I might be able to look after myself as well. And that really started me on the journey. Mm. So where, where, did you, um, where did you end up first training then? Because my guess is there wasn't necessarily a Kung Fu club right there on the doorstep to hand. No, no. Well, actually, it was a, a club opened down at the old bus station in Bristol, and uh, a guy used to travel down from Birmingham, George Taylor, his name was, and um, he had clubs all over the country, and uh, he opened one in Bristol, and it was teaching a system of Kung Fu called Pak Mai Kung Fu. It's like a Southern Shaolin, Shaolin style, and uh, to be honest, at the time, I, I wouldn't have cared what it was. I just yeah. wanted to train in, uh, uh, in Kung Fu or martial arts, so... Um, I went along there, had no idea what I was going into or letting myself into, um, but I was just uh, absolutely over the moon that I found a club, particularly in Bristol at the time, which um, there wasn't many uh, clubs about and been able to start my training. Mm, excellent. So, so did you stick with that for a long time or, or, or did you move into the... I stuck with it for a couple of years, but then um, the same as a lot of things, you know, we started off with great numbers and then enthusiasm began to go and the numbers dropped down. And in the end, uh, George couldn't really afford to come all the way down from Birmingham once a week. So the club disbanded, which then a few of us um, looked for the nearest thing. And at the time there was a Taekwondo class being run at... Um, the, the Bristol Victoria Rooms, a uh, large building up at Clifton there by, um, it was actually a Chinese student who was at Bristol University. And I went there for another year and trained in Taekwondo, but um, the sort of high kicking arts and things that were, wasn't really my, wasn't really my thing. And um, I was still not a hundred percent settled with that and was looking for something else. You know, maybe that little missing link uh, so then um, I sort of moved on again from there. So I had a couple of early years in um, Kung Fu and Taekwondo. 
Um, from there, I spoke. The next thing was um, I, I went to Aikido. A friend of mine uh, said, "Come along and try this." And I didn't at the time. I didn't really want to. I was still into the punching and kicking, but I said, "Okay, I'll go along." And uh, the first lesson was like a total disaster. I just thought, "I'm never going to be able to get hang of this. It's too complex." But he said, "Come back, come back." So um, I went back for another couple of weeks, and um, then another couple of weeks become a couple of months, and. Um, then I, I began to enjoy it and could see like the other side of things, you know, particularly the locks and holes. And um, then I went on to spend a good five years in that and trained directly under many uh, great Japanese instructors. And it was a it was a good time for me. I was sort of in my, my late teens, and it um, really taught me um, discipline and give me a path to follow. Um, otherwise, you know, I'd probably been off doing something stupid at that age. So. Um, uh, I do owe a lot to the Japanese for the way that they taught and, um, you know, the sort of principles and ethics that they brought to the art at the time. Mm, no, absolutely. Because because um, at first it was going to be an obvious question as to um, the transition from the Chinese to sort of the Japanese style of arts, because they're quite different, aren't they? But actually, yes, they are. Yeah. Yeah. The way that you've just explained that, that sort of uh, explains how you sort of ended up going through that. So. The, the jiu-jitsu journey then, obviously that's what you fell in love with, but you ended up, I believe, making your, uh, your own take on the system, the Goshen jiu-jitsu. So how, how, how does that formulate? Yeah, um, well, again, in, in Bristol and the Southwest at that time, and I'm probably talking about the early 80s, uh, there was no jiu-jitsu whatsoever. Um, but for me, it sort of filled the gap between um, what I was doing in Aikido and what I'd learned previously with the striking arts. And jiu-jitsu was somewhere in the middle there that com seemed to combine all those things together. And that's what attracted me to it. And I really thought this is the, the missing link I've been looking for. Um, but uh, at the time, there was just nowhere about. So uh, the, the first place I went to was in, in London. And the uh, instructor there, his name was Derek Connolly. And he trained directly under Richard Morris and uh, Robert Clark, which were two big names in uh, uh, jiu-jitsu at the time and he just said come up for a weekend me and a couple of others free of charge and he just taught me and started showing me jiu-jitsu and I remember going back on the train from London to Bristol and my head was absolutely spinning I thought this this is it I've, I found what I'm looking for um, but with jiu-jitsu there's so many styles and systems of it um, and they're all fragmented so um, over the years then, from, from London, I, I went and trained in Southampton uh, and Portsmouth with other instructors. And then eventually, uh, Liverpool was the main place I went to to train with some of uh, uh, the instructors that went on to grade me. And that's also uh, where I met Dave, etc. So um, really, I, I guess my system is an amalgamation of a lot of things I learned from many different instructors and then tried to put know my own spin on it um i probably say i never had one jiu-jitsu instructor which i called my main sensei simply because i was in bristol and they were up the other end of the country so um, most weekends would find me you know packing my kit bag and traveling to wherever it was and gradually bringing back ideas to bristol where me and three other students used to hire a hall and just train three hours a week to try and put this all together to eventually be able to get graded and start teaching it so it was um it was a long and arduous process rather than having somebody on the doorstep yeah i mean that's an interesting thing isn't it because the that that every weekend driving up north um over and over relentlessly i remember a lot of that as well and um it's it's again it's interesting because you don't see so much of that these days i suppose a, because there are gyms on, on everybody's doorstep now, but uh, maybe there's also an element of um, people don't think that they need to go to find the right person so much. I don't know. It's a, maybe just the skill set has been raised so high now. Maybe the bar's just so high. Um, yeah, I think also the internet just allows you to get techniques at your fingertips from any instructor you want to train with. Uh, where back then you, you did have to travel. If you wanted to train with a particular instructor, um, you physically had to go and travel uh, to meet them. So I think it's, it's made a massive difference, uh, the, the internet in this day and age for people. 
Yeah. yeah, well, one of the uh, one of the things that sort of comes to mind when people speak about yourself, because obviously you're highly respected within the industry, and a lot of people, um, a lot of people, uh, have, have come through your training and trained with you, and so on and so forth. And you've left the sort of your, you know your mark on the British martial arts scene, if you like. But one of the things that stands out for me is the fact that you're very well renowned for the reality side of things, but you you've also competed yourself and brought through some really good competitive fighters so how, how do you manage the two because they don't always go hand in hand no they don't um when i first uh, got into mma i mean at the time this was probably 98 maybe 99 and uh, it wasn't even called mma then it, it was just no hold barred or valley suit or whatever name they gave it um but it was something that give jiu-jitsu people a chance to test their skills in a competitive arena. I think up to then, you know, you had judo, you had karate, but there was nothing really that allowed a jiu-jitsu uh, practitioner to maybe try and practice those skills in a, a sporting arena. So that's what sort of attracted me to it. And at the time, I was trying to juggle and teach uh, combat jiu-jitsu. I was teaching MMA, I was teaching grappling, and I was juggling all these balls. And it was very, very difficult. So um, I really wanted to try and go as far as I could in MMA, simply because the clock was ticking for me. I suppose at the time I was probably in my late 30s, and uh, I knew if I wanted to do something, this was the moment, otherwise I wouldn't be able to do it. So I had to put the uh, combat jiu-jitsu on the back burner for a little while, and other people taught it for me, which gave me a little bit more freedom to go into the MMA route. I found out very early, if you wanted to keep competing MMA, you can't do it half-heartedly. You've got to be 110%, otherwise you're gonna get, gonna get hurt. Mm -hmm. So um, I knew that I had to sort of give all my energies to that. Uh, and that's how I began, began to do it. And for uh, probably two or three years, um, I solely concentrated on the MMA in favor of uh, the combat jiu-jitsu. Yeah, yeah. Well, I actually remember seeing some of your MMA fights and being in the audience, and also being around uh, people like James Thompson uh, when you yeah. were helping him to come through and stuff. So it's you know, there's that there's that sort of long history there where a lot of people now they don't um, a lot of a lot of the younger guys they don't re remember or, or weren't around when MMA was first starting out when it was pretty rough and ready and raw because now yes. it's not formed to itself. Um, but certainly, but, yes. Mm. And so you, your, your, your guys now, your boys now, they've, they're obviously taking up the mantle and they're running with that and, and doing, you know, really well. So when you look at the, the modern day version of MMA and you look at, say, uh, BJJ, which is one of the sort of core principles of, of, of MMA training these days, uh, there's quite often a little bit of, shall we say, friction between the traditional Japanese and the BJJ. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think it's a shame, actually, because I think both systems have got something to offer. Um, what I always think is that um, Japanese jiu-jitsu and um, like the combat jiu-jitsu I teach um, teaches like a missing link between the standing and the ground. So um, I think BJJ in itself has changed dramatically since um, the early 2000s, where most comp competition now is is on the ground from start to finish, where in the earlier days that wasn't wasn't the case. And um, you know, I've I've been fortunate enough in those early days to go and train with people like Henzo Gracie, Hoist Gracie, and a lot of them that came over here in the first place. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. To me, you know, jujitsu is jujitsu. It just depends what arena or area you're going to apply it to. Um, so um, I feel that it's a shame. I think. There should be more seminars where um, the Japanese jiu-jitsu can be linked. I think what you can see is you've got to remember that you know original jiu-jitsu really was um, as a weapons art. It was all evolved around the sword, and if uh, you couldn't use the sword, then this is where the, the grappling came into form. But you can see how those techniques still exist, but they're so far away from the original you wouldn't recognise them unless you had an instructor that can explain and show the link. And I think for myself, this is what I could do. And um, I would like to have a little bit more 
you know, to do with uh, the BJJ and been able to make the link between the two systems. Because I think it's a vital thing that's actually missing in this day and age from jiu-jitsu training. Yeah, totally. Well, I think that's, that's a, uh, an interesting thing for somebody to try and pick up because that, that would be a very rich source of, of information gathering between, uh, between the BJJ community and people like yourselves because there's you know, we all, it's different branches of the same tree, isn't it? And I've said that several times during some yes. of people. So, um, so moving on from that then, one of the things as well that, that you've become very prolific at is writing. Um, and yeah. there's, there's been a number of actual sort of uh, um, books, sort of biography type books, but you've also gone into fiction as well. Yes, yes, I have, yeah. Yeah. How is, how is um, that? Right. Um, I've always enjoyed writing, even since a youngster. And I can remember, you know, the young boy with exercise books sat down writing short stories and stuff like that. So obviously it was probably something that was in uh, the back of my mind, but never really had any encouragement from, um, you know, any sources to say, oh, go ahead and do that. Um, so um, I first started writing because I thought, I would like to be able to get my ideas out uh, so other people know that I'm actually training. Bristol at the time was really like a, like a sleeping giant, really, where martial arts was concerned, particularly in the, the 80s and 90s. And um, so I thought if I could write for some of the martial arts magazines that were obviously about at the time, like combat and fighters, and those, it'd be nice just to let people know, hey, look, there's something going on down here in Bristol, and it's, you know, not just up the country. So um, Jeff Thompson, like, when I got to know him and train with Jeff, he was very uh, helpful in giving me some tips and opened a few doors to, uh, you know, give me some names of people that I could send my stuff to, and really that sort of started it off. So, um, the more you write, and if it gets received uh, by the public and they enjoy it, then um, I always had that thought of, I'd love to write a book, you know? So I always had this idea about writing this book about a smaller man's guide to, to fighting, and it, nothing had been done like it. And um, I used to love Roadhouse, the film Roadhouse, and the saying I thought you'd be bigger just stuck in my head. I thought that would be a great title for a book. So um, I had this idea, but I had it for absolutely ages, and um, I had it on a back burner. Then I tried to send it out to people, and uh, I had so many rejection letters, I could have had another book out of them. <laughs> so uh, eventually I, I did get a little break. But I always remember a good friend of mine um, who was... Um, a prolific book collector and reader and I told him about the idea and he said do it because he said somebody's going to get that idea sooner or later themselves and they'll pick it to the post so it made me pick up the book again and try and get it published which um which I did which was really great and then that just started I thought well, if I can if I can publish one could I do another and if I get another one could I do another and then all this information that I had in me started to flood out. But one of the other reasons why I, I realized I had so much information, um, but I thought I need to get this down on paper. I need to have like a, a solid evidence because um, otherwise it's, it's gonna just disappear eventually. So I went on a bit of a mission to get as much as I could into my books so that people that couldn't train with me on a personal level would be able to buy the books and um, you know enjoy what I had to say there. Um, but from there, I, I've always again had this thing to write a fictional book, and I guess all the other writing was probably leading to this. Um, and I, I wrote a couple of books of short stories, and uh, they were okay, but I thought I'd really like to write like a, a novel length story. So, um, it was a massive test, it was harder than anything I'd done. I'd rather get in the cage than <laughs> another fight uh, because it pushed me so much. Because I'm, I'm not, you know, I didn't leave school with any uh, notable qualifications or anything like that. So I'm, I'm basically sort of just doing this uh, for myself. But um, I managed to com complete one, which was great, and had it published and a follow up. And at the moment, I'm in the process of uh, writing the third one. So um, yeah, it's just it's just been great. I I, I love it. It's uh, it's challenging, but in a different way. Yeah, no, excellent. Because I mean, I, I I enjoy writing myself, and it's something that I know a lot of people say. You know, oh, they've got a book in them, and it's one of those stock phrases, isn't it? So yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people, maybe they want to take a run at it, but aren't sure how they go about it. So did you have a 
did you have like a set system that you used? Did you force yourself to write X amount of words a day or did you have any program that you followed? Yeah. Um, I can remember like my early books and it seems, <laughs> it seems like stone age now, but I wrote them all by hand in an exercise book and uh, my, my wife, uh, Tina, typed them all on an old typewriter. So you actually had like the old manuscript that you, you sent off physically. And um, I know recent with one of the books gone back a while, the, the, man, the manuscript got lost when I sent it off. And just touch wood, it was just at the time where I was working on a computer and I had another, uh, another copy. But you can think back before that and you were sending it off in the post hoping God it would get there, otherwise it would disappear. So, um, yeah, even then I would, uh, it, it was a hard schedule because um, I was teaching martial arts as a, a full-time job. So, um, you know, I would say teaching in the morning, training on top of that, and then it, coming back in the afternoon, between going out on an evening again to teach, that's when I would write, I would make myself write. And sometimes I was so t tired, <laughs> fall asleep in front of a you know the computer or my hands were so sore from training that I had a job to type but um, I made myself do it because it was just something else that helped my career it was another string to the bow which you know yourself as a, a martial artist you you've got to have you just can't sort of rely on one thing and I think no matter how good you are, your physical skills eventually will wane and you've got to think, what else have I got? Have I got any other avenues to still pursue and make a living out of? Oh, absolutely. And also, um, I think the very real point is that the majority of people got into martial arts because they wanted to challenge themselves and that doesn't go away. So that then leads really to the next question, which is, um, you, you know, you've always been at the forefront of stuff and you've always been challenging yourself, whether that be getting in a cage or writing a fiction novel, which scares me to death, by the way. Um, what's next? Well, I'm still going to write in. Um, like I said, I'm sort of on the third one now and it's, it, I'll just let you know, it don't get any easier, man. <laughs> <laughs> just in case. Um, but um, I find those challenges are, are, are much more um, how can I say, appropriate for me where I am. I think on a physical level, I've done everything that I set out to do when um, I started in martial arts, you know, um, and some of the things that I, I've done, I never thought I would get to, you know, I, I was lucky enough, I got to fight professionally in the cage and I was well into my 40s then, which I look back and you know, people say that's amazing, but I just took it in my stride. It was what I'd done. I never really thought about it. And, um, you know, even it, recently, sort of uh, when I was 54, went and up to Naga and entered it and won a silver medal in uh, my category. And um, it was just crazy. Just, I uh, just sort of thought, this is, this is great. But I realized that's about it. You know what I mean? I, I was absolutely knackered afterwards. <laughs> and as fit as I am, I'm like, hang on a minute, I'm going to have to find somewhere else to do that. So um, the physical side of it, obviously, I, I still train. I, I love teaching. I, I don't teach classes anymore, but I, I teach um, privately. And um, I find it that quite rewarding, simply because if the person's paying to come to train with you, then um, they want to. They want to achieve. They want to do what they want to do, and I find that you can get a lot more out of that. So um, I'm still doing that, and um, still training and keeping myself as fit and healthy as I can. But I think most of my challenges are off the mat these days, rather than on them. No, absolutely, that makes sense. So, um, given given the the length of time that you've been training, and there's and obviously so much has happened in that time frame that the whole face of martial arts has changed could you um if i had to put you on the spot could you say one benefit to the modern way of doing things and one downside to that yeah i think um it's, it's, you can't sort of generalize it across the board because um obviously some some clubs they've got different ways of training to others so um but um for me i think the early days uh they were quite pioneering days because you didn't really know what was going to happen. You were, you were training and martial arts wasn't a massive global thing as it is now. So particularly in the um, early days of MMA, um, I say to the guys, you know, we, we used to go and enter with like talking with a pair of bag gloves on and a 
they were swimming shorts and weren't really sure what the rules were. You just done it until the ref might have said, hey, well, you're not allowed to do that or, or whatever. It was really uncertain, but it was, there was a certain rawness to it and uh, it was exciting. It was very exciting. Um, and I think martial arts back then, it was all about discipline, hard training. It was really sort of not just forging the body, but also your mind. And I think it, it, it really did make me as a young man, it, it, it sort of helped me so much. I think this day and age, um, great. I mean, the same as anything like the motor car or the aeroplane or whatever, it, you know, martial arts get better and better. And there's some fantastic people out there and, and the level of instruction is brilliant. Um, but I think sometimes the discipline is missing and the respect possibly uh, also. And I, I think, you know, also it depends on the clubs, but I think for me, the sort of laps of daisy type of uh, easy going training is not really... Yeah, not really for me. Uh, when I'm on the mat, I still bark and shout at people. I can, <laughs> and they know what they should and shouldn't be doing. But maybe that's an age thing. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's a fair. I think it's a fair analysis, really, on that. But I, I mean, I do remember. I actually came to one of your classes. It must have been about. 91 or 92 at the time you had a lot of door staff that was training with you um and at the time i was training elsewhere but came along and i re i remember i mean you, you there was this sort of this, this this sort of expression of seriousness and and my goodness me i mean you were there was no denying it you were you know force of nature absolutely and um and everybody had such respect for you and that was something that i did remember really sp specifically was because um, at the time I was going to all kinds of different clubs and just, you know, uh, and just just checking things out, you know, and that's one of the things I do remember about your club and your guys was there was uh, there was a, a huge, a huge amount of respect, not just for yourself, but for what they were doing. Yes. Yeah. So, I think, you know, that really went back to the, the training I had under the Japanese instructors like you. Um, when you went on their mat, you've done what you were told. You know, if you were late, you stood on the edge of the mat and until they acknowledged you were there and, you know, you could, all, all that sort of stuff. And um, I think that that's an integral part of what the martial arts were about. And I think um, that should still be in it. I, I think that level of respect should still be in there. And um, I guess that's where I, that come from. So it influenced me in the way I saw how I should be teaching on the mats like, yeah. Mm. Uh, I, 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 I agree with you. I think that's one of the things that uh, we need to try and keep up because that's that's where a lot of the benefits come from is that particular way of doing things. So um, if it was too easy, we, you wouldn't get the, the, the huge benefits that you get from the training. So um, I'm afraid we're pretty much coming to the end of time on this, which is a real shame because I'm loving chatting with you. Uh, but for people that want to reach out and, and find how to uh, maybe connect with you in some way, how would they go about that? Yeah, uh, my website is um, kevinohaven.com and um, you can email me through there. Uh, and also, I've got my products on there, my books, my videos, DVDs, etc. And I also write a little blog on there. So, you know, people can certainly contact me through there. And um, also Impact Gym, which um, both my sons run these days, but I'm still very much up there and, and active. So you could find me through there or any of my other instructors that are teaching combat jiu-jitsu at the gym. All right, excellent. So, Kevin, thank you so much. It's been a genuine pleasure talking to you. And, um, and, and yeah, I'll have this up and live very, very shortly. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure, Matt. Nice to speak to you, mate. And Bye -bye. thank you.